Imagine a young country with a population less than 4 million. A place where international football participation only kicked off in 1994. Yet, against all odds, these underdogs soared to the pinnacle of world football, adorning their trophy room with three World Cup medals, and looking at the way they're currently evolving, it seems like it's just a matter of time before they finally win some silverware. But how could that happen? With one of the smallest populations in Europe and such a recent history, how could Croatia achieve so much and so rapidly? Today, I'm gonna answer that question once and for all and explain the miracle behind their meteoric rise. And if you think it's just a matter of luck, I got a teaser for you. If it wasn't for their bad luck, they might have already clinched both the Euros and the World Cup. But first, let me give you some context. Before Croatia was declared an independent state, the country was part of Yugoslavia and as expected, Croatian players represented the Yugoslav national team. Furthermore, no Yugoslav player was allowed to play outside the country until he was 28, which helped develop a strong footballing culture. In fact, the Yugoslav national team was even called the Brazilians of Europe due to their very technical style of play. And what they achieved in their 72 years of history was also pretty respectful. After all, two silver medals in the Euro Championships and two fourth place finishes in the World Cup is undeniably a remarkable feat. So as you can tell, football was already ingrained in the Croatian youth and not only became more apparent during the 1987 Under-20 World Championship. Yugoslavia brought 18 players to Chile, but the best of the bunch were Croatian. Boban, Stimak and Prozineki were present in that tournament and they would be vital to the country's first triumph in that competition. Sadly, that's not the main reason behind their success. After the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, nationalism intensified in Eastern Europe and as a consequence, Croatia looked to gain independence. But the Serbs wouldn't concede it without a fight and did everything in their power to prevent it from happening. 20,000 Croatians lost their lives and it's thanks to them that Croatia exists today. As you can imagine, such a massive conflict would have to spill over into football and there were two matches that defined the character and grit from the first Croatian Golden Generation. The first was a league match in 1990 between Dinamo Zagreb and Red Star Belgrade, where an infamous Serb nationalist called Arkan incited the Red Star Ultras to start a riot in the stadium. The Zagreb Ultras didn't hold back and the fight got out of control. Police tried to intervene, but it was clear to everyone there that they pretty much let the Serbs do whatever they wanted while viciously punishing the Zagreb supporters. But out of nowhere, in an act of defiance, Dinamo Zagreb's captain Zvonimir Boban kicked a police officer in the head to protect the Croatian supporter. His rebel act inspired a generation of Croatians to fight for their independence, but unfortunately, that wasn't the last time the Yugoslav war invaded football. One year later, Yugoslavia hosted the country's last ever cup final. The underdogs from Croatia, Ajduk Split, faced off against the mighty Champions League winners Red Star Belgrade, and although that match didn't have a literal riot happening, it was undeniably a high-tension encounter that no club could afford to lose. Ajduk Split would be the ones on top after 90 minutes, and the cup they won that day is considered by many a war trophy. And in a way, they're right. At this point, I think it's pretty evident that not only did Croatia achieve their ultimate goal of independence, but they have also proved themselves to be superior to Serbian football for the past 30 years. And that domination started in that day. In short, the Croatian players had no other choice. Amidst a nationalist chaos, they were forced to be the joy of the people. They had to make an impact and prove that they could hold their own against the elite of football, just like Yugoslavia had done for the past 70 years. But none of that would have ever happened if it wasn't for this man. The Croatian boys from 1987 were now the man who led the country's national team. They were great footballers with a lot of grit and determination who played for the best clubs in Europe. On the other hand, despite their considerable footballing quality, those players were equally known for their substantial egos. And Chiro, as he was dearly referred to, kept them all in check, with their feet on the ground and head in the clouds. He treated them as if they were his children, he just knew how to handle them and by doing so, he extracted as much as possible out of their golden generation. In the 1996 Euros, Croatia were eliminated by the eventual winners Germany, while in the World Cup two years later, the Vatreni would have their revenge against Germany, thrashing them 3-0 and only lost in the semis, once again against the eventual winners. Nevertheless, by the time the new millennium rolled around, the Croatian golden generation was well beyond their prime. Following their failure to qualify for Euro 2000, a period of mediocrity set in for the country's football. It's not like they fell into obscurity, they just became an average team, regularly qualified, but couldn't normally go past the group stage. 
During the next 20 years, Croatia might have failed to showcase stellar performances on the field, but behind the scenes, the individuals who endured the country's darkest period were shaping an elite group of players. Bilic and Stimak, who were heroes among the last Golan generation, didn't achieve outstanding results as managers, but they passed on their fighting spirit to the younger generation. Modric, Rakitic, Mandzukic and Perisic are perhaps the standout figures of a crop of late bloomers who emerged when the people no longer expected them to. And this time, they came even closer to fulfilling Chiro's prophecy of winning the World Cup, reaching the semi-finals in 2022 and the final in 2018. Although this is impressive, it is still clear to me that with a little bit of luck on their side, this Croatian generation could have achieved way more. In Euro 2016, Croatia were better than Portugal and lost on a later counter-attacking effort. Had they won that match, they would have an easy route to the final, with Poland and Wales standing in their way. While in the 2018 World Cup final, Croatia created way more chances than France and had some unfair calls against them that flipped the game completely. But in the end, that doesn't really matter. Croatians are extremely proud of their national team and support them no matter what. Politicians dress football shirts and stop their jobs to watch football, while the kids are encouraged to prioritize watching the team's matches over having classes. Ultimately, the reasons behind Croatia's incredible rise to glory are the country's suffering and need to affirm themselves in the international stage, combined with the great footballing history that the region has. It doesn't make a difference that Croatia only has 3.9 million people in the country, or that they don't have the best youth coaches or infrastructures compared to other nations. As long as their fighting spirit lives, they'll always be a threat at the grandest stage. And that is it for the video, leave a like if you want to watch more content like this and subscribe so you never miss the most interesting football discussions, stories and top 10 lists. I'm so close to 2000 subscribers and with your help I'm sure I can reach that goal until the end of the year. Thanks for watching until the end, I appreciate your support and I will see you soon.